In this video, we're going to discuss functions. So functions make up the basis of a lot of what we do in algebra, and we'll also encounter them a lot during this course. So a function is actually just a special type of equation. So let's start by talking a little bit about equations, and then we'll build on that and we'll discuss a function. So equations are often used to model relationships between inputs and outputs in real world situations. So because this is essentially an applied math class, we're going to focus on equations in context in terms of an actual applied situation. So if we're talking about a situation where we have inputs and then associated outputs, typically we're going to use the variables x and y to represent them. So x represents an input and then y represents the output that goes with any particular input. So in a lot of cases, we may want to graph an equation. We can determine a lot about a relationship between inputs and outputs by graphing that relationship. So one of the simplest ways, one of the most straightforward ways to graph a relationship, to graph an equation, is going to be point by point plotting. In other words, we're just determining individual x and y pairs, and then we're graphing them on the coordinate plane. If we can get enough ordered pairs, we can determine the general shape of the graph and we can graph the equation. So the ordered pairs represent solutions to our equation. In other words, if our equation has the variable x and the variable y, we're looking for combinations of x and y that will make that equation true, that will solve that equation. So let's start with a basic example. So suppose our equation is 5x plus 8y is equal to 40. So this equation models the relationship between the variable x and the variable y. Again, we think of x as an input and y as an output, but any value of x and any value of y that in combination make this equation true represent a solution to this equation. So the graph of this equation is all of those solutions put together. If we were to take every x and y pair that satisfy this relationship, put them on the coordinate plane, that is going to represent the graph of this equation. Now, this particular equation is what we would call a linear equation. We know it's linear when both exponents are one. So if you look at the variables x and y, neither of them actually has an exponent written, which means it's an understood exponent of one on both of the variables. In any situation where we have an x and a y, and the exponent is one, in other words, we don't see an exponent on those variables, then our equation is linear. Linear just means that if we were to take this equation and graph it, the graph is going to look like a straight line. So it's either going to be a diagonal line, a vertical line, or a horizontal line. In most cases, it's going to be a diagonal line, particularly if we have both x and y in our equation. Now, if we know we're looking at an equation that's linear, we know just based on the form what the shape of the graph is going to look like, we only need to find two solutions, in other words, two xy pairs in order to graph. Two points actually uniquely identify a line. So as long as you have two points, two solutions to this equation, then that's going to be enough to generate a graph for the equation. So in a lot of cases, the easiest points to find are going to be the ones that we get when we allow each variable to equal zero. So if we're going to take an equation and we're going to graph it just based on plotting points, typically what we're doing is we're choosing a value for x and then we're solving for the associated value for y. So in other words, picking an input, solving for the associated output. It doesn't have to be that way though. We can also pick values for y and then solve for the corresponding values for x. In this case, we're going to graph by finding what we call intercepts. So if we let each variable equal zero and then solve for the remaining variable, the ordered pairs that we're finding actually represent the locations where our graph is going to cross the x-axis and where it's going to cross the y-axis. So suppose we allow x to be zero. So in other words, we're picking a value for x. What we want to do is we want to substitute that value into our equation in place of the variable x and then solve for the associated value for y. That's going to give us a solution, one possible solution to this equation. So imagine taking a zero and substituting it in place of x. So we would have five times zero, which comes out to zero, which essentially means that that first term disappears. So what we would then have is eight y 
is equal to 40. So eight is multiplied by y. If we want to isolate y, which is our goal, we have to divide out that eight from both sides. So if you were to divide it from both sides, you get 40 divided by eight, which is going to give you five. So based on this equation, if we allow x to be zero, the associated value for y has to be five. Now, we're saying that these two values in tandem solve this equation. So it's helpful to take those and then substitute them back into the original equation as a pair. And as long as the equation remains true, then that's verification that that particular ordered pair does in fact represent a solution to that equation. So if we were to graph that as an ordered pair, the ordered pair would be 0, 5. What that says is to graph, move 0 units horizontally along the x-axis. In other words, starting at the origin, we don't go anywhere. But we have to move 5 units vertically, 5 units up along the y-axis. So 0, 5, don't move horizontally, stay on the origin, but move up 5 units. So that's going to be the ordered pair 0, 5 right there. So anytime we allow x to be zero and then solve for y, what we're finding is a y-intercept. We're finding a point where our graph crosses the y-axis. And as it turns out, in most cases, the equations we're gonna look at will only have one location where they cross the y-axis. They'll only have one y-intercept. Now, we also would like to have an x-intercept. We will get an x-intercept if we let y be zero. So first time we chose x to be zero, now we're choosing y to be zero. So imagine substituting a zero in place of our y right here. So we'd have eight times zero, which is zero. So that middle term disappears. And then we're left with five x is equal to 40. And again, if we just divide out the number that's multiplied by x, so divide both sides by five, 40 divided by five, is going to give us eight. So if we allow y to be zero, the associated x value has to be eight, giving us the ordered pair eight comma zero. So starting from the origin, that ordered pair tells us we wanna travel eight units horizontally along the x-axis, and then we don't wanna move anywhere vertically. So in other words, we're staying on the x-axis, and that's gonna be the location for that particular um, ordered pair, that particular point. So anytime we have an ordered pair where the y-coordinate is zero, that's going to represent a location on the x-axis, what we call an x-intercept. Now because of the form of this equation, because we know it's linear, it's going to graph as a straight line, once we have two points on the graph, all we have to do is connect those points and that's going to give us the graph for the equation. Now, only graphing using two points is specific to linear equations. In most cases, if we have a more complicated equation, we're typically going to need more than two ordered pairs. Usually we'll need at least three or four in order to graph accurately. But in this case, having two is going to be sufficient. And again, just to review what we did, we're choosing a value for x, substituting it in, solving for the resulting value of y that would make the equation true. Or we could choose a value for y, substitute it in, and then solve for the associated value of x, again, as an ordered pair that makes that equation true. And keep in mind, we can do that for any type of equation, but if we have a more complicated equation, just having an x and a y-intercept may not be enough to give us an accurate graph. We may have to find a couple more points in order to get a sense of what the graph is going to be shaped like. So let's look at another equation and let's graph it by plotting points. So we have y is equal to nine minus x squared. So this is also modeling relationship between x and y, but notice we now have an exponent attached to our x variable. As soon as we have an exponent involved, it means the graph is going to be a little bit more complicated. The higher the exponent in most cases, um, the more complicated the graph is going to be. So in this case, we're gonna, need to, we're gonna need to graph a couple more ordered pairs in order to get an accurate picture. Ideally, don't limit yourself. Graph as many as you think you need until you start to see the picture. Now, when we have an equation like this, notice that y is already isolated. X is in the mix, but y is isolated. In most cases, the equations we use are going to be some variation of this, where the output is isolated and then the input is involved in some type of algebraic expression. In these cases, typically what we want to do is rather than choosing a y value, we want to stick to just choosing x values. 
the reason this is going to be easier to do is because if we just substitute in x values, all we're doing is simplifying the right-hand side of the equation. And once we simplify it down to a single value, we're going to have y is equal to that value and we'll know what the y coordinate has to be. If we were to substitute for y and then solve for x, it's going to be a little bit more complicated because then we're gonna to have to use some algebra to move things around in this equation and then isolate a variable, in this case x, which is not already isolated. So anytime you already have the y isolated, typically you just want to choose values for x and then use those values to solve for the associated y value. So I wanna show you how you can do something like this in your calculator and save a little bit of time. So if you've got your graphing calculator, get that out. I wanna show you how you would type this into your graphing calculator. So we will use this kind of calculator quite often throughout the semester. Most of the things on this graphing calculator you're never gonna need. So we're gonna focus on the specific things that you will use. So these top buttons, notice those top five buttons, in this case my buttons are kind of grayish, light gray. These are gonna be your graphing buttons. So if we actually want to graph something, those are gonna be the buttons you're going to use. So the button on the far left that says Y equals, that's where you're actually going to type in the equation for what you want to graph. So if I hit the Y equals button, it brings me up a list where I can type in um, as many equations as I want, honestly. How many does it go down to? It goes down to 10. So you can type in 10 equations at the same time. Typically what we'll do is we'll type one at a time, and then if we want to then type another equation, we'll clear what we already have and then we'll start from scratch. So we want to graph this particular equation, y is equal to nine minus x squared. So notice it already has the y equals part. I don't have to type that. There actually isn't really a way to type y equals. Our variable button is gonna be right here. It's next to the button that says stat and the button that says alpha. That's gonna be the variable button, but any variable we use that comes from this button exclusively represents an input. It represents, in this case, x. So it represents a bunch of different possible inputs. The t, the theta, and the n represent inputs in different kinds of situations. So when you hit this button, it's just going to type an x for you. It's not gonna type all of those different things. But this is gonna be the button we use when we want to actually type in um, our variable into our equation. So we wanna enter this in, again, avoiding the y equals because we've already got that. So we want nine minus x squared. So I'm gonna hit the x button, and then I need an exponent of two. So there's actually two different places on the graphing calculator where you can get something like an exponent of two. So if you look on the left-hand column, right next to the comma, diagonal from your seven, it says x squared. If you hit this button, then that's going to put an exponent of two on whatever it's right next to. So if it's right next to an x, we'll be squaring an x. If it's right next to a constant value, it will be squaring that particular value. So that's gonna be one place you can find it. The other button you're gonna use for an exponent, and this is gonna be the button you use for any other type of exponent, is gonna be the button right above the division symbol, the up arrow, the caret symbol. So if you hit the caret symbol, it's going to create an exponent for you. Now yours may format it like mine does. If you have a newer graphing calculator, it probably formats it as an actual exponent. In other words, it creates a superscript for you. If you have an older graphing calculator, when you hit that button, it may just draw an arrow for you and not necessarily format it truly as a superscript. In other words, change the formatting. It's okay if it does, it's okay if it doesn't. It means the same thing. So as long as you've hit that button and either you have a superscript or it's drawn that arrow for you, you have an exponent and your calculator knows you're typing in an exponent. So once you hit that button, now you can type your exponent of two. And of course you wanna go back through, make sure you read through it, make sure that's exactly what you wanted to type. So we wanted nine minus X squared. That looks like nine minus X squared. It looks like we're good. Okay, so I'm gonna hit enter and now it's saved. Okay, so what I want to do now, I wanna get a graph for this. I want the picture. So if you go to the other side of your graphing buttons, it says graph. If you hit that button graph, it's going to graph that equation. So I'm gonna hit that. And it brings up a coordinate plane. 
and then it's gonna trace the graph for me from left to right. Okay, now what if you type it in, you hit graph, yours doesn't look exactly like this. More than likely, it doesn't look like that because you have some type of specific zoom setting enabled. So I wanna talk a little bit about zoom. Keep in mind there's a lot here. There's a lot more than we'll ever be able to talk about in terms of zooming, formatting things on your graph. We're just gonna look at the things that are gonna be beneficial to us. So there will be a couple different zoom settings that may be helpful, particularly if you type it in and what you get doesn't look like what I have. So the middle button in the graphing row says zoom. If you hit that button, it's gonna give you a bunch of different options for zooming. So zoom in and zoom out, those are gonna be the buttons you use if you want to, of course, zoom in or zoom out. So if you hit one of those buttons, essentially what it's gonna do is it's gonna bring up the graph again, it's gonna give you a cursor, you can move the cursor around, and then if you hit enter, it's going to zoom in or zoom out, but center at the location you now have for your cursor. So it allows you not only to zoom in and zoom out, but also kind of shift the graph around depending on what part of the graph you wanna look at. The ones we're gonna focus on are gonna be options five and six, which are gonna be zoom square and zoom standard. I actually wanna look at both of those in this case and show you the difference between the two. So let's look at zoom standard option six. If you've never done anything with zooming on your calculator, more than likely that's gonna be the view your calculator is already in. So if you highlight that particular option and then press enter, it's gonna take you back to the graph and there we go. So notice nothing changed for mine because that was the zoom setting I was already in. So in, again, in most cases, that's gonna be the zoom setting that's already on your graphing utility. Now, one drawback to this setting, it's hard to see here, but if you look really closely at the tick marks along the y-axis and the x-axis, you'll notice that the tick marks along the y-axis are actually closer together than the tick marks along the x-axis. What that means is that this graph is slightly skewed. Things are spread out a little bit more horizontally and they're kind of squished together vertically because we have a different scale horizontally and vertically. So what if we want to interspace things evenly so that the X's and the Y's have exactly the same scale and we're not gonna have a skewed graph? That's gonna be the option zoom square. So if you go into zoom again, option five, zoom square. What that's going to do is that's going to evenly space your X's and your Y's. So if you highlight that option, press enter, there we go, it's gonna graph it again. So notice it's basically the same graph, but now it looks a little skinnier. It looks a little bit skinnier because remember the X coordinates were stretched a little bit more. The scale along the X axis was stretched. Now the scale along the X and the Y axis are, is going to be the same. So in this case, this is going to be the most accurate graph we're going to get for this particular equation. So what can we get from the graph? Well, more than anything, we get the picture. We get a sense of a shape. This is a U-shaped graph. We actually call this a parabola. So anytime we have an equation in X and Y and the highest exponent on our X is a two, we're going to have a graph that's some variation of this U-shaped parabola graph, okay? But what we don't get here is the actual ordered pairs on our graph. So our focus is on graphing as accurately as we can. Shape is not enough. And also we have to be careful in assuming where points are. So they may look like they're in a particular location just based on how much we can see, how much detail we can actually see from the graph. But we have to be careful because things that look to be close to a unit may be slightly off of a unit to the left or to the right. It's hard to know just looking at a graph like this because the graph can be potentially misleading. So another feature in your graphing utilities that's gonna be really, really helpful to use is going to be the table function. So the graph is gonna give you a picture. The table is actually going to give you a bunch of different ordered pairs that represent the points on your graph. So if you look at the graph button, right above it in blue, it says table. So anything that's in blue, if you look above all your buttons, you have a bunch of different things in blue. That's a function attached to the particular button you have, but you access it by hitting the second button first. So if I were to hit the second button and then hit graph, 
it's going to bring me into the table. And again, this table just represents ordered pairs on my graph. This is gonna be one of the most beneficial things you get from this graphing calculator. The graphing utility is great. Having that picture is nice, but again, the picture can be slightly misleading if we don't know really what we're looking at and we're not sure how accurately the points are graphed and what the details really look like. The table is as detailed as it's going to get and the table is based on actual algebraic values. So the benefit of having the table here is if our goal is to graph ordered pairs, well this is giving us all the ordered pairs to graph. So notice what's happening along the x column. The x column just has integer values. It has whole number, counting numbers, positive, negative, um, and it's increasing by one unit each time. So as long as you're in that column, you can use your cursor to move over, highlight things. As long as you're in the X column, you can scroll up and down. So if I scroll up, I'm going more into the negative X values. If I scroll down, I go further and further into the positive X values. So depending on what I want to look at, I can scroll to whatever location I'm interested in. Now we just want to get a few ordered pairs in order to be able to graph this U-shaped parabola graph accurately. So in general, a good habit is to choose the X value zero as long as that's an option on there. Occasionally you'll see maybe um, an X value and then it might say error next to it. That means that particular Y value is undefined for that particular X value. But as long as you see actual numbers in the Y column next to each X value, those are gonna be actual ordered pairs. So a good habit is to start with X equals zero. Think of that as sort of the center of your graph. It's the center of your coordinate plane. And then choose maybe three or four X values on either side of that. That's typically enough to give you a pretty accurate graph. So if we look at x equals zero, the associated y value is going to be nine. So for zero, for an x value of zero, the y value is going to be nine. Now we can actually verify that algebraically. Remember, we're picking a value for x, which means substitute it into our equation in place of that variable, and then simplify and solve for y. So if we substitute it in zero, we have zero squared, which is zero and then nine minus zero is gonna give us nine. So we would get a Y value of nine, which is what this table is telling us. Now we wanna get a few ordered pairs on either side. So let's look at the negative numbers first. So if we plug in a negative one, we would get an output of eight. So negative one, eight is gonna be another ordered pair. Negative two, five, negative three, zero, and then negative four, negative seven. Those are all gonna be solutions to this equation um, than representing ordered pairs on this graph. Now we also want positive inputs and matching outputs. So we have 1, 8, 2, 5, 3, 0, and 4, negative 7. So once we have all of that, and again, hit the graph button again, that's going to give you the picture again. We know roughly shape-wise, this is what we're looking at, these are going to be actual fixed, concrete, predictable values that we can use to graph this particular equation. So if we start at zero, x equals zero, there's zero nine. So zero nine says don't go anywhere horizontally, but just move vertically nine units. Okay, in the negative direction, negative one eight. So that says move negative one units horizontally, then move up eight units from there. And then negative two, five, negative three, zero, and negative four, negative seven, which means we're now dropping below the x-axis. Now notice on the positive side, we actually have matching outputs. That's because this particular graph, this particular equation has some inherent symmetry to it. This particular graph is actually going to be symmetric across the y-axis. And we see this because the y values are then repeated. So negative one matches to eight, well one also matches to eight. Negative two matches to five, well two also matches to five. So that means this graph is going to be mirror image across the y axis. Now notice we chose y, or excuse me, we chose x to be zero and solve for y. In the process of finding ordered pairs to graph, notice we also found 
coordinate pairs where the y value is zero. Remember, we called those x-intercepts. If y is zero, then the associated x value represents a location on the x-axis. So even though we didn't specifically choose a y value of zero, the table actually ended up giving us locations where the y value was zero and then the associated x value. So even though we didn't actively seek to find these, the table did end up giving us x-intercepts. Now notice in this case, we actually have two of them. If you were to compare to the previous equation we graphed, notice we only had one x-intercept. So we had one y-intercept, one x-intercept. So I mentioned y-intercepts typically you'll only find one. Well, in this case, we only have one, but notice we have two x-intercepts. X-intercepts and y-intercepts are different in that sense. So again, you'll typically only have one y-intercept, but you can actually have a bunch of different x-intercepts. So in this case, we actually have two, but again, depending on the equation, we could have three, we could have four, we could technically have none at all, that's a possibility, but that can vary just depending upon the complexity of our equation. But that's gonna be a relatively accurate graph, so keep in mind, we don't actually have a line connecting all of these points because some points are closer together than others. So there's actually a curve here. So obviously I'm not grading your artistic skills, but you wanna graph as carefully as accurately as possible. In this case, this is a U-shaped graph, not a V-shaped graph. So as you connect those particular coordinates on the coordinate plane, you want to have some curve to this particular um, graph. Okay. So now that we've talked a little bit about an equation, x represents your input, y represents your output, we can graph by just picking x values, solving for y values, or vice versa. Let's build on that and let's talk about a function. So the title of this section was functions. What is a function? So let's define that. So we have an equation. We've got a representation between an input and an output. So we're still talking about x. We're still talking about y. That's the context, we're gonna build on that. So a function is going to be a correspondence. We'll call it a correspondence rather than just an equation. This definition is going to apply whether we have an equation or a graph or maybe some other representation of the relationship between X and Y. So a function is going to be a correspondence connecting inputs and outputs in which, this is, the, um, this is the definition for a function, this is the requirement, in which each input, in other words, each x value, corresponds to exactly one output or y value. Now, what does that mean? What that means is that if you think of x's as things you plug in and y's as things you get out, x's are inputs, y's are outputs, what this definition means is that for any x value you choose to plug in, you get out exactly one y value. What it means is that the relationship between x and y is predictable. It means if you choose an input, you know exactly how and exactly what your y value is gonna be. You know how to get a y value, and you know that once you find that y value, that's gonna be the only y value you can get. So some equations, that's not gonna be the case. In some equations, we can choose an x value, we can choose an input, but it may match up with more than one output, more than one y value. So then the question becomes, well, which one do we want? Which one would we actually choose? And the answer to that is without extra information, we don't actually know. So there's some ambiguity. There's some question about what particular values would we want? What values do we get? Which ones apply in a particular situation? A function is an equation where the relationship between X and Y is predictable. You plug in an X value, you can only get out one Y value, you know how to get out the Y value, and it's gonna be one Y value for each X value exclusively. So that's gonna be our definition for a function. Now, once we have that definition out of the way, um, I would say 99% of the time, I can't honestly think of a situation um, in this class where we'd have an issue, but 99% of the time, if you write a relationship between X and Y, or if you use the kind of relationships we're gonna use in this class, 99% of the time, the type of equation we're looking at is automatically going to be a function. Again, so once we put in something, we know exactly how to get an output out, and there's only gonna be one output that goes with any particular input. Okay, so any input matches up to exactly one output. We can think of all the inputs 
and all the outputs in our relationship as being unique sets, particular sets that we might be interested in. So maybe we wanna focus on just the inputs for an equation. Maybe we wanna focus on just the outputs. We have names for those particular sets. So the domain is the name that we're gonna give all the possible inputs for our equation. In other words, all of our different X values. So why are we worried about that? If we're thinking about numbers we can plug in, well, can't we typically just plug in whatever we want? In most cases, cases the answer is yes. But there will be some equations that we write or that we use where certain things can't be plugged in because they result in us somehow violating the rules of algebra. So there will be some situations where some inputs won't be allowed. There will be certain X values we won't actually be allowed to plug into the equation. Those values will not be in the domain. So the domain is gonna be all the values that we can plug in, that we can treat as inputs and then find an output for. Well, once we plug in all of our domain values, we get out Y values, and if we take all of those together as one big set, we call that the range of our function. So the range is gonna be all the different possible outputs or Y values that we can get. So in a lot of cases, both of these sets are gonna be what we call all real numbers. All real numbers just means you can plug in anything you want. Your particular um, correspondence, your relationship is defined based on any input and the range will potentially be all real numbers as well. In other words, you can plug in anything you want and you can get out any possible value. There will be some equations where there are restrictions, but in a lot of cases, we can plug in any number we want, we can get out any number we want. When we have issues with domain, we'll specifically discuss those situations. Okay. So once we have a function, there are different representations for a function. So we'll look at equation representations, but if a function is just a type of equation, then it should have a corresponding graph. So suppose you have a graph and you don't have the equation, but you want to determine just based on this graph, am I looking at something that is or is not a function? If I could see the equation for it, well, would it be the equation for a function? or would it just be some equation that unfortunately doesn't meet the requirement for a function? So if we have a graph, we're gonna use what we call the vertical line test to determine whether or not we're looking at a function. So the vertical line test states, if each vertical line that passes through at most one point on the graph, in other words, if you picture this graph, imagine drawing a bunch of vertical lines. Imagine drawing a vertical line everywhere across the coordinate plane. What you want to determine is if any vertical line you draw passes through the graph at most one time. In other words, it passes through once or it doesn't pass through the graph at all. If that's the case for any vertical line that you would draw, then you can determine that the graph's equation is a function. The graph does represent a function. Now, if instead you can find a vertical line where it passes through the graph more than once, maybe two times, maybe three times, but regardless, more than once, that's your justification for saying that it's not a function. So I wanna look at a couple um, graphs. We'll look at one of each type. And for the one that's not a function, I wanna talk about how the definition for a function and how this graph go together. So our first graph, it's linear, okay? So we know that if we were to look at the equation for this graph, we've got an X, we've got a Y, we only have exponents of one, that's how we know it's linear. This particular graph does represent a function. Just based on the vertical line test, the way we would verify that is if you imagine drawing a vertical line anywhere on that graph. What we're looking for is how many times that vertical line passes through our actual linear graph. Well, we can't literally draw every single vertical line. It's more of a visual inspection kind of thing. If you imagine drawing vertical lines across that whole graph, notice it'll only cross the graph in one particular location. So the vertical line crosses the graph and then it goes below it and it never hits below the graph. It never hits anywhere above the graph. So any vertical line we would draw would cross this graph exactly one time. So that is our indication that this graph represents a function. It passes the vertical line test. Now the next graph we have fails the vertical line test. All you have to do is find 
one vertical line that crosses the graph more than once. Now some areas on this graph, if you were to use the vertical line at that location, it would look like it passes the vertical line test. So for instance, this particular section here in the middle, this graph has two branches to it. This particular section here in the middle, if you were to draw a vertical line, the vertical line doesn't cross the graph at all. So it would pass the vertical line test. If you were to draw a vertical line right there at the tips of those branches, imagine drawing vertical lines there. Well, at those particular lo locations, the vertical line crosses only one time. So at those locations, it looks like we passed the vertical line test. But if you look at the other portions of the graph, so I just drew a line here. This is not the only line we could use though, but this particular line, notice it crosses our graph at two locations. That is our indication that this particular graph fails the vertical line test. If we can find a location where a vertical line would cross more than once, that's our indication that our graph fails the vertical line test and the equation that would go with this graph is not actually a function. So how does the vertical line test in this case fit with our definition for a function? So if you remember, the definition for a function is we have an X and Y correspondence, but every X matches with exactly one Y. Well, here's the reason based on that definition that this graph would actually fail the vertical line test. So think about those two ordered pairs, those two locations where this vertical line crossed um, this particular graph. So those particular ordered pairs are associated with an X value of six. So if you went to X equals six, drew a vertical line, that would be the vertical line you'd get. Those would be the two associated ordered pairs on your graph. The problem here is if we think of the X values, everything along the X axis represents an input. This location represents an input value of six. Well, notice if we have an input value of six, it matches up with a Y value of four, but it also matches up with a Y value of negative six. So then the question becomes, if we choose an input, an X value of six, are we gonna get an output of four? Or are we gonna get an output of negative six? That's a question that we would then have to answer. And the answer is it could go either way. And without having extra information, we don't know which one, if either, is the output we actually want. So the definition for a function states that for any input, we get exactly one output. Well, this is one location where a particular input actually matches up with two different outputs. So that's why this particular graph and its associated equation would fail that test for being a function. It fails the vertical line test, but based on that, it fails the requirement for each input only having at most one output. So the vertical line test, the definition for a function, they go together and that's why they go together. Notice on this particular graph, if you choose any input, it matches up with exactly one output. Choose an X value, there's only one Y value that represents a location actually on the graph. So for every input, it matches up with exactly one output, exactly one Y value, and that's our definition for a function. Okay, so say we wanna know if something is a function. Algebraically speaking, there's a lot involved in determining whether or not something represents a function. But worst case, suppose you have a graph. Well, you can use the vertical line test. Suppose you don't have a graph. Well, you know what you do have? You have a graphing calculator. If you can take your equation and graph it in your graphing calculator, then you can use the vertical line test. So any equation you have, if you're not sure whether or not it represents a function, and that's a question you wanna answer, put it into your graphing calculator. Use the graphing utility. You type it in, under the Y equals button, you hit graph, and that's gonna give you a picture. If your picture passes the vertical line test, then you know you have a function. If your picture fails the vertical line test, then you know you have something that is not a function.
So we're going to operate off of the assumption in most cases that what we're looking at is a function because functions are going to behave the way we want to. The kind of relationships we're going to define in all of these different applied contexts we're going to look at are going to be relationships that are based on some type of functional relationship. In other words, you input something, you know exactly what you get out, you only get one output from each input. So suppose we have an equation, we do know that it is in fact a function. If we know that our equation represents a function, we're going to use a special notation to indicate that, to say that, well, not only is this a relationship between X and Y, but it's a special relationship, it's a functional relationship. We know when we plug in an X that we get out a Y, we have a function. There's a notation to say this relationship is in fact a function. So suppose our original equation is y is equal to 2x plus 1, okay? This is a function. Let's prove it's a function though. So remember, if we don't know what we're looking for, graph it. Put that in your graphing calculator. So if you still have your old graph in there under y equals, highlight it and then clear it, and it's going to clear it out. And notice if you graph it now, it's just going to be a blank coordinate plane because it doesn't have anything to graph. So go back into y equals, we want to type the equation y is equal to 2x plus 1. Well, we already have y equals, so we just need 2x plus 1. So 2, our variable button, remember right next to alpha, underneath mode, right next to stat, hit that. So 2x plus 1. And then I'm going to hit enter. Okay, so that's saved. Now I'm going to hit graph. And there we go. That's going to be our graph. And again, if it doesn't look exactly like this, yours may be slanted a little bit more. That's probably because you're in Zoom Standard. So let me go back to Zoom Standard, which is where most of your calculators are gonna be. So if I go to Zoom, Option 6, Zoom Standard, that's gonna be what your graph looks like. So it's a diagonal line that passes through the y-axis at one. We could look at the table for ordered pairs, but at this moment, all we care about is the graph. Does this particular equation represent a function? Well, if we look at its graph, our graph, at least this section, looks like it passes the vertical line test. If you were to imagine drawing a vertical line anywhere on this coordinate plane, it's going to cross through that particular graph only one time. Now, what if something crazy happens on the tails? How do we know that something crazy doesn't happen on the tails where suddenly the graph gets weird and it fails the vertical line test? That's gonna be a good time to use zoom. So if you hit zoom, we want to zoom out. Zooming out is going to allow us to see more of the graph. So if you go to option three, zoom out, select that, hit enter. Notice it doesn't actually zoom. What it does is it brings up a cursor. The cursor is again going to allow you to center your graph at a particular location. So say we want to center at that Y intercept. You can use the arrows to move around. So if I want to go to a y-intercept, I just need to move up. Now notice down here it says x equals 0, y equals 0. As you move, it's going to give you the coordinates for your location on the coordinate plane. So right now I'm centered at the origin, which is 0, 0. If I move up, notice the y value has changed. I didn't move horizontally, so x is still 0, but I moved up, so now y is something that's bigger than 0. I'm going to keep moving up. It increases just a little bit over time. And then notice I go from x equals zero and then y is a little below one. And then I keep going and y is a little bit above one. Well, that means that I'm somewhere around that intercept at one. How do I get around that? Hit the trace button. The trace button, which is right next to graph, is going to lock you onto your graph so if you want to move around, but you don't want to move around the coordinate plane, you only want to move around on your actual graph. If you hit the trace button, that's going to lock your cursor in so that you're only tracing along your graph. So if you hit trace and then move around, notice it's only going to move along your actual graph. So if you want to investigate some actual ordered pairs on your graph, that's going to be useful using that trace button. So let's see if I can now get to my intercept. There we go. So x equals 0, y equals 1. So when x is 0, y is 1. So that's going to be my y-intercept. Okay, so investigate some of these tools. 
don't, what you don't want to change, you don't want to go in and mess with your window settings or your table settings. I would leave those alone. But y equals trace, graph, table, all of those functions are going to be really useful um, in different situations. So now I'm right where I need to be. I want to zoom to that location. So I'm going to hit zoom. And remember, I want to zoom out and I'm already centered where I want. So I'm going to hit enter after I put my cursor where I want. I'm going to hit enter and it's going to zoom the graph out. And now we can see more of the graph. Well, now we're seeing these tails that we didn't see before. It doesn't look like much changed, but we're seeing a bigger section of the graph. We could keep going. So if you were to zoom again, zoom out again, stay centered where you are, zoom out again. Now you're zoomed even further out. So again, you're not really seeing any difference because this is a line. The line looks the same no matter how far in or how far out you are. But because this continues to zoom out and we're still just seeing this diagonal line, not much has changed, we can still say that our graph passes the vertical line test. So this is a function. So that was a big side note just to say, yes, we are looking at an equation that is a function. Okay, so notation for a function. We have this equation, we graphed it, we know it represents a function. We have a specific notation to say this equation does in fact represent something with a functional relationship between our input and our output. So if our original equation is y is equal to 2x plus 1, function notation is going to take that y and it's going to replace it with this notation f and then in parentheses, we have x. Now, normally when we see parentheses around something in math, your intuition might say multiply. So for instance, you know to use the distributive property if you have a number outside parentheses, and maybe you have addition or subtraction inside parentheses. Typically, that's what parentheses mean. In this case, parentheses mean something different, and this would also be read differently than you might intuitively think. So if you see this and you think multiplication, maybe you think f times x, which is completely logical to think. If that's your immediate intuition, that's what it should be, because that's normally the way you would read that kind of notation. This notation in the context of a function means something different. This notation represents an output. So y represented the output when it was just a generic equation. This is read as f of x. So instead of f times x, we read it as f of x. This now represents our output. So x is still our input. And f of x, which is the same thing as y, they're interchangeable, they mean the same thing. y means output f of x means output. So f of x represents the output for a particular input. So what's really going on here? There's a couple different components to this notation. The f part, you can think of that as just a name for the function. So this is a functional relationship. We're naming it f. Sometimes you'll see g, sometimes you'll see h. You can have pretty much any letter there you want. The letter in front of the parentheses is just a label. It's just a name for the function. Now, whatever's inside, that represents the input for the function. So in this case, our expression for finding a value is going to be 2x plus 1, where our input is x. So that's why we have an x in parentheses here. This x means the input that we're using is x. If we had maybe an input of t, sometimes you'll have situations like in physics where time is considered your input and then maybe position, location is considered your output. In that case, your input would be t, so you might have something like f of t and then something involving t on the other side. Your input can be whatever you want. Specifically, it can also be numeric. So if we were to take this x and replace it with a numeric value, say we replaced it with 0 or we replaced it with 1, what that's telling us is that that is now the specific input we want to use. So x as a variable is just a generic input. x can take on pretty much any value we want. f of x is just the general function. It's the general function and this is the rule to find values with that general function. If we replace this x with a fixed number, then what we're finding is the function value, the output, for that specific input. What it's really telling us to do in terms of 
what are next steps? What do you actually have to do from there? It's telling us to evaluate, which is a fancy way of saying, plug in the given input in place of x. So if we took this x and maybe made it a zero, for instance, we would read that as f of zero, and what that's telling us to do if we see that notation is it's telling us, we'll identify on the other side the actual rule for the function, the, the actual expression that tells us how to take inputs and get outputs. Evaluate that, simplify it by substituting zero in place of x. So anytime we put an actual number or anything, ultimately anything, in those parentheses, f of something specific, what that's telling us to do is then take that something specific, take that specific input, and replace that generic variable input, in this case x, with whatever that value is, and then just simplify it down. So let's look at a couple examples using this function notation. This is gonna be the notation we use a lot for the rest of the semester. So we actually have three different functions here, different rules. Notice the functions have different labels. They have different labels so we can differentiate which one we're looking at. So if we're looking at the function f, well this is the rule that takes an input and gives you an output if we're using the function f. If we're using the function g, we have a different rule. If we're using the function h, we also have a different rule. So different labels indicate that we're using different functions. So the first thing we want to find is f of six. So how do I know what I need to do when I see something like that? Well, first thing, we need to identify which function we're using. Notice we have the label f, which means we're using the function rule that has a label of f. So we're using that first function rule, which says 12 divided by x minus two. This is going to be the expression that allows us to take an input and get an output from it. So f of six, what that's telling me to do is reuse the rule for f, but apply it specifically to an input of six. In other words, take the rule for f and evaluate it or plug in a value of six in place of your variable. Now there may only be one instance of the variable. There may be more than one x in the problem. Wherever you see an x, you would replace it with a six. Now when we plug in, I can't emphasize this is enough. This is a very important habit to get into. When you plug it in, you need to put parentheses around it. So what are we doing? We're taking that expression, 12 over x minus two, and where we have an x, we're now plugging in a six. But again, I'm gonna put parentheses around it. That's gonna be really, really important. That's an important habit to get in now. And then we just need to simplify all of this down. Now, if we're just gonna follow order of operations and simplify, that's gonna give us the steps we need in order to make sure we simplify things correctly and get to the correct answer. So order of operations, parentheses, exponents, multiplication or division, just left to right, and then addition or subtraction, just left to right. So in this case, we have a division and we also have a subtraction. Now, normally we do division before subtraction, but you can think of the whole numerator and the whole denominator as being their own little sets of parentheses in a sense. You have to simplify things inside of the division before you can do the whole division. So first thing we'd have to do is the six minus two, which would simplify down to four, and then we can do 12 divided by four, which is gonna give us three. So that means f of six is equal to three. It means based on the function f, if we have an input of six, we get an output of three. What this also means is that if we were to take this function and graph it, this would be one of the ordered pairs on our graph. It would have an x value of six and then a corresponding y value output of three. That would be one of the ordered pairs on that particular function's graph. We could do that for any other number of inputs. The more inputs we do it with, the more outputs we get, the more ordered pairs we have, the closer we can get to an accurate graph. So that's essentially what it's gonna look like. What's gonna change potentially is the function we use and the input we use. So what about g of negative two? Well, that means now we're using the function g, okay? And we're applying it to an input of negative two, which means go to the rule for g, which is one minus x squared, and then substitute in this specific output in place of x, in place of our variable. 
So g of negative 2 is going to be 1 minus negative 2 squared. Now again, when we sub it in, you need to put parentheses around what you substitute. It would not have made a huge difference here, but it does make a difference here, and I want to show you why. Let's say we want to simplify that in the calculator. Okay. Let's say we want to go one step at a time though, rather than typing it all in in one line, which we'll also do, but rather than typing it all in in one line, let's say we just wanted to go step by step with order of operations so that we can show our work. Okay, so we have a subtraction and then we also have an exponent. Order of operations says we do the exponent first. Now there's two different variations of what this exponent might look like just based on how we type things. So what if we did not have parentheses, okay? So I type negative two. Now here's a spot to be careful. We have two what looks like negative buttons. This means subtraction. This means make a number negative. So if you were to type negative two and then square it like that, oh, that's not what I want. Negative two and then square it. Hold on, sorry, have it a moment. Never mind. it's not gonna work here, okay? So suffice it to say, if you want to type something, make it a negative number, you're going to have to use this button rather than the subtraction button. This is an actual algebraic operation. This is the button you use to make a number negative. So say you were to type negative two and then square it, okay? And then hit enter. That gives you negative four. Now, what if you put the parentheses around it? So parentheses, then negative two and then square it. Well, you get a different answer. Which one is actually right? As it turns out, the second one is right. It's a positive number, not a negative number. Why is that? Well, think about what squaring means. Squaring means taking a number and multiplying it by itself. If you take two positive numbers and multiply them, you get a positive output. What if you take two negative numbers and multiply them? Well, two negatives multiplied together also give you a positive output. So when you take negative two and square it, you should get a positive four. Well, then why did negative two squared give you a negative four here? Did your calculator make a mistake? Well, the answer to that is no. Your calculator did not make a mistake, but it interprets things very, very literally based on how you type them in. So what is your calculator doing right here? What it's doing is order of operations, ultimately. So when your calculator sees this, it knows to only apply the exponent to whatever is right before it. Well, in this case, what's right before it is a two. The negative in this case is not actually attached directly to the two. The way your calculator interprets this top statement is it's two squared and then it's all of that multiplied by a negative one. Well, if you were to take two and square it and then multiply it by a negative one, you would get a negative four. Only by putting parentheses around your negative does the calculator know that you want to square not only the two, but also the negative. You want to square the whole negative two rather than treating the negative as something separate. So having those parentheses there is crucial. Not having the parentheses will change your final answer. It changes what your calculator does, which ultimately will change your final answer. So having those parentheses is going to be very important. So we take our negative two and square it, we get a four. We now can do the subtraction and we get one minus four, which is gonna be negative three. Now, what if you wanted to type all of that in one line in the calculator, specifically this expression we get where we substitute our value? You can do that as well, but again, just make sure you have your parentheses. So one minus negative two, there's the difference between the two notations, subtraction and then negative two, and then we're squaring it. And sure enough, that's gonna give us a negative three. So that means for the function g, whenever we have an input of negative two, the associated output is going to be negative three. So that would be an ordered pair on this graph if we were to graph this particular function. Okay, let's look at another one. So h of five, before we flip all the way over, let's look at h. So the function h says square root of x minus one. Okay, so h of five says take the rule for h, substitute in a five, make that the specific input. So that's going to be the square root of five minus one. 
Well, under the square root is kind of like contained inside parentheses. So you have to simplify underneath the square root first. So five minus one gives you four. And then you take the square root and that gives you two. This can also be verified with your graphing calculator. Where would you find a square root? Well, if you look over to the left, go to the square button, right above it, you see the little radical symbol, the square root symbol, but it's in blue. So if you hit second and X squared, it's gonna bring up that square root and it's gonna give you a box inside the square root. So whatever you wanna type is then under the square root. So we're gonna type five. Let's see, I'm about to not use parentheses. Let's use parentheses. Parentheses five minus one. There we go. Now suppose I wanted to keep typing something that wasn't under the parentheses. You have to arrow over to get out of the parentheses before you do anything. Let me delete that. So if we simplify this down, that's gonna give us the square root of four, which is going to be two. Now it's worth mentioning here because we haven't seen anything like this and I mentioned when we were talking about domain and range, there will be some functions where there are issues with the domain, okay? So where might that happen? That could actually happen here. So suppose I wanted to evaluate h of zero. Suppose I wanted to use the function h but apply it specifically to an input of zero. What would that look like? Well, I'd take the square root, I'm using an input of zero, and then I'm subtracting one from it. And then I'm gonna hit enter. It gives me an error and it says non-real answer. So let me get out of this, let me go back and look at it. Why does it give me an error? Well, think about what happens to that number under the square root. If we take zero and subtract one, we get a negative one. So what we're really evaluating is the square root of negative one. And again, if I hit enter, same error. We cannot actually take the square root of a negative number. That's one of the operations in algebra that is not defined. There are ways to deal with this but there are ways that require us using numbers that aren't like our normal number system. They're not gonna be numbers that we could graph. Our concept is gonna be ultimately numbers that we can graph. So taking the square root of negative one takes us into this range of values that aren't actually numbers that we can graph on our standard coordinate plane. The way I want you to think of something like this though is you see this, it's undefined. It isn't actually a number. Now there are actually going to be a lot of different numbers that would give you a problem here with a function like this. So if you were to take the square root of say negative one minus one, same error, same kind of thing. So any number that you would plug in that would give you a negative number under the square root, something smaller than zero. It doesn't even have to be negative one. It could be negative 0 0.5, something like that. Say you took the square root of negative 0 0.5. Okay, same kind of thing, you still get an error. You can't have a negative under the square root. So any input you would plug in that would then give you a negative number under the square root is gonna give you an error, which means that those particular values, the numbers that you plugged in that gave you an error, those would be numbers that are not in that function's domain. We can plug in a lot of different numbers and get outputs, say we, so we did it with five, say we did it with three. So plug in a three, subtract one, square root. Not a pretty number, but at least it doesn't give you an error. The input three is in the domain of the function h. But for instance, the number negative one is not in the domain for h. So the domain is gonna be all the values that we can plug in that don't give us errors. Any values that we plug in that would give us an error represent numbers that are not in the domain. So we're not gonna spend a ton of time on talking about domain and range. That's more a college algebra kind of concept, but it is valuable to be aware of these kinds of things. Depending on the type of function we have, there are some things we can plug in and there will be some things that we potentially can't plug in. The square root operation is gonna be one of those times where suddenly problems pop up that we don't normally see and we just have to be aware of them. Okay, let's look at one final example f of zero plus g of one minus h of 10. What's going on here? Well, there's actually three function evaluations, one involving f, one involving g, and one involving h. So what do you do in a situation like this? Well, this is kind of two problems in one. It's function evaluation, which we just did for three examples, 
And then you're taking the result of that function evaluation and you're adding and subtracting. So this is kind of a layered situation. This is taking functions and then adding them and subtracting them. But we have to use the rule for F, the rule for G, and the rule for H applied to those specific inputs. So F of zero, well, let's flip back over. So F is going to be 12 divided by X minus two. So we're applying that function to an input of zero. So 12 divided by zero minus two, sub and zero in place of X, okay? G of one is then being added to that. The rule for G says one minus X squared. So one minus input of one squared. Notice I put brackets around that. That's to indicate that not only are we adding, but we're adding the whole G of one, not just one and then subtracting one squared. We're adding that whole thing, whatever that is. So having parentheses around that is gonna indicate that each of these individual values has a little bit more involved um, inside of them, but we're taking the whole result of whatever that function evaluation is and then adding it and subtracting it. Okay, and then the last one we have is H of 10. So that's gonna be square root of 10 minus one. So as I essentially have three little mini problems inside of this one big problem. So I wanna simplify each of those individual evaluations and then I'm gonna add and I'm gonna subtract. So my first one, my denominator, zero minus two is gonna be negative two. And then 12 divided by negative two is gonna be negative six. So that's gonna be the first evaluation value. That's the output for f of zero. Now g of one, one minus one squared. Well, one squared, we do that part first. That's gonna be one. One minus one is gonna give us zero. So g of one is gonna be zero. And then h of 10, square root of 10 minus one. Well, 10 minus one is nine. The square root of nine is three. If you're a little rusty on square roots, don't worry about that. Your calculator will handle it for you. So the square root of 10 minus one is going to be three. So now all we're doing is combining those individual function outputs using addition and then subtraction. So negative six plus zero is gonna be negative six, and then we subtract three, and we get a final output of negative nine. So we can use function notation in different ways. We can do individual evaluations. We can combine function notation with other function notation using different functions, using the same function. There's a lot of variations. Big takeaway though is the letter out front, that's your label that tells you what function you're using. The number inside, if there is a number inside, that's the number you're plugging in as your input. So you plug it in as your input, simplify everything that's left, and what you get is then gonna be the output that goes with that particular input. Now this idea of function notation, this is how we use it if we have an equation for our function. But if it's a notation that's all encompassing and rep that's representing everything we can do with a function, we should be able to use it when we have any type of function. Maybe it's represented by a graph. We can represent functions in different ways and we can still use this kind of notation. The biggest thing to remember is that f of x, that new function notation, remember where it came from. It came from the y. So if y is equal to 2x plus 1 was our original equation, the only thing that changed when we used function notation is the y became f of x. What that means though is that they mean the same thing. They're interchangeable. So where I see f of x, I can just as easily put a Y because conceptually they represent the same thing. They represent the output that goes with any particular input. So we can use function notation with a graph as long as we remember what's what, what we're looking at in different locations. So suppose we're given F of a number. In other words, we're given F and then we have a number inside of it. Well, what does the number inside of it mean? Remember that replaces X. So if we're given a number inside of it, what we've been given is the x value. We've been given a particular x value. So f of that number, what that represents is the output that goes with that particular input. So if we're given f of a number, we're treating that as our x value, 
and we're looking for the matching y value. And we'll see what that looks like on the graph in just a second. But just keep in mind, anything inside the function notation is an x value. f of that x value means we're looking for the associated y value. Now, if instead we're told f of x, notice the x is just an x, we're told that f of x is equal to a number, what does that mean? Well, remember f of x and y, those are interchangeable. So that's the same thing as saying y is equal to a number. Well, if y is equal to a number, then what we're being asked to find is the x value that goes with it. So essentially, you're either gonna be given x, which means you're looking for y, or you're gonna be given y, which means you're looking for x. So just different ways of using the function notation. But based on a graph, x and y are represented visually. So let's look at a few examples here. So when y is equal to f of negative two, y is equal to what? Okay, so what do we actually have here? We've been given f of negative two. This is the function f, this is its graph, and we've been told we want f of negative two. Well, remember, anything inside the function notation represents an x value. So what we've been told is that we have an x value of negative two, which means we want to know what's the y value that goes with an x value of negative two. Well, how do you make that determination based on your graph? What you're gonna do is you're going to use your axes strategically. So we've been told that x is negative two. So this is our x-axis. I wanna to go to the location where x is going to be negative two. So if we start at x equals zero, travel two units to the left, this is gonna be where x is negative two. So what am I looking for then? What I'm looking for is what is the output that goes with that? F of negative two represents the output that goes with an input of negative two. So you can actually do this visually. If you go to that location where x has your particular value you want, take a straight edge of some type and line it up with that location. So that's the location where x is equal to negative two. What you're looking for is the y value associated with this x value that's actually on our graph. So if you go to where x is equal to negative two, this is the location where we cross our graph. Well, what's the y value at that location? The y value at that location is going to be positive two. So that means f of negative two, the output associated with an input of negative two, is going to be y equals two. Another way of thinking of that is if we have an ordered pair that has an x coordinate of negative two and it's on our graph, then the y coordinate that goes with it is gonna have to be positive two. Now let's look at another one. So y is equal to f of one. So y is equal to what? Well, f of one, again, that means our x value is one. It's inside the function notation. So that means it represents an x value, specifically an x value of one. What does f of one mean? It means what's the output associated with an input of one? So our x value is one, we travel to one on the x-axis, and then we're looking for the y value that goes with that. So again, use your straight edge. We're going to x equals one. We're looking for where we cross y, where we cross the graph. This is gonna be the location where we cross the graph. At that particular location, our y value is going to be negative four. So f of one is going to be negative four. And again, we can base that on our ordered pairs. So when x is one, in order to be on this graph, the y coordinate that goes with an x coordinate of one is going to be negative four. So that's gonna be our value there. Now, if we flip it around, as it turns out, we may actually be able to get more than one answer. So say we know that f of x is equal to zero. What have we been given? We haven't been given the x value because it's still just the variable x, but we've been told that f of x itself is equal to zero. Remember what f of x means. It means y, it means the same thing as y, it means output, it means we have an output, a y value of zero. And the x is the unknown, so we know y, we're looking for the x that would go with that particular y value, that value of zero. We can do this the same way, but now we're traveling along the y-axis. So here's the y-axis. 
we're letting y be zero, which means we're staying right there at the origin. So we're going to where y equals zero, okay? And then we want to cross over where y is equal to zero. Notice now I'm orienting it so it's horizontal. We're looking for where we cross the x-axis if we let y be zero. Well, in this case, notice we cross the x-axis in two locations. We cross it at negative one, and then we also cross it at positive three. So that means we actually have two x values associated with a y value of zero. So that means x is either negative one or three, and we're gonna put both down because both are options. Now you may be looking at that and saying, doesn't that, eval doesn't that violate the rule for a function? We can't have anything that's repeated, right? Well, that's not the case here. All we're saying is that for any x value, it matches only to one y value. But we can have different x values matching to the same y value. All we have to know is that if we plug in negative one, we know exactly what we're gonna get out. If we plug in three, we know exactly what we're gonna get out. The same inputs, or excuse me, different inputs can match to the same output, but once we choose an input, that input can't match to different outputs. Again, think about it from the standpoint of just the vertical line test. This graph passes the vertical line test. When x is negative one, we only cross the graph one time there. The y value that goes with that is zero. But it just so happens that when x is three, the y value that goes with that is also zero. So we can have different x's matching to the same y, we just can't choose an x and then it match to two different y values. If you've never seen functions before, that's probably gonna take a little bit of time to set in. The biggest thing to come back to is the vertical line test though. If you can graph it, does it represent the vertical line test and then go from there. Okay, last but not least, f of x is equal to four. So we don't know x. We've been given that f of x, aka y, is equal to four. And we wanna know what are the x values that would be associated with a y value of four. So same thing, now we're on y. We wanna go to where y is four. So one, two, three, four. That's the location where we're at four on the y axis. Take your straight edge. So one, two, three, four. There we go. And we're looking for the associated unknown, currently unknown, x values or value. We could have one, we could have two, we could have three. It's just based on the graph. Associated with a y value of four. In other words, if our y coordinate is four, well, what would our x coordinate have to be? Well, x could be negative three. If we go out to x that's negative three, the associated y value is four, or it could be positive five. If we go out to positive five, we also have a y value of four. So in this case, if f of x is equal to four, then x could either be negative three or it could be five. So we're gonna list both of them because both are valid possibilities. Okay, so that's just a little taste of function notation. Now, most of what we're going to do with function notation is gonna very much be in an applied context. We're gonna be talking about specific functions that model specific things. So I wanna look at a little application, something related to business, just to give you a sense of what these kinds of things are gonna look like when we put them in context. So in a business context, functions are often used if we want to analyze profit and loss. So we're gonna keep the concept of the business really simple. The ideas of making money and losing money can get really complicated depending upon how complex the business is. But ultimately, we're gonna keep it simple. If you can keep it simple and develop a model for the simple situation, then that model can then just be expanded to handle more complicated situations. So we're just going to assume we have a very simple company that just produces and sells a single product. So we make something, we have costs for making something, we sell it, we make revenue for selling it, and then whatever's left over after we cover our costs, that represents profit. If we're profitable, that means we have enough money to cover our costs. If we're losing money, that means we don't have enough money to cover our costs. So in this kind of situation where we're analyzing profit and loss, we actually have several different functions that represent the different components of this kind of situation. So we're going to look at four of them. 
And keep in mind, pretty much any situation can use these four functions. What may change is how complex the functions look, okay? So our first function, think where you start in the process. If you're producing and selling something, you have to start by producing, right? Okay, well, in order to produce, you have costs. There are certain things you have to pay for in order to produce your product. So costs typically are either fixed or variable. You'll have a fixed component of your costs. You'll have a variable component. Fixed means you have to pay it no matter what. Variable means how much you pay is gonna depend on how much you produce. So what could represent a fixed cost? Well, fixed costs are otherwise known as overhead. So the kind of things factored into overhead would include, for instance, your utilities. You gotta keep the lights on, you gotta keep the AC running. You do all of that even if you make one product, you do it if you make 10, um, no matter how much you produce nothing or a ton of things, the fixed costs are always going to be the same. Executive salaries, um, utilities, taxes, your advertising budget, those kinds of things, those costs are not dependent on how much you produce. So the value there is going to be fixed. Now variable costs are going to depend on how much you produce. In other words, the less you produce, the less you pay. The more you produce, the more you pay. Those would be things like your raw materials for producing, the labor for producing. You use, you make a little bit, you have to use a little bit, you make a lot, you have to use more of it. So these two components put together are going to give us our cost function. So we're gonna call it C of X, C standing for cost. X in any of these functions that we're gonna look like represents the number of items. So in this case, it's gonna be the number of items we produce, so the cost of the number of items we produce is always going to be your fixed cost, which is just a fixed number, plus your variable cost, which is going to be a cost per unit, maybe 50 cents per unit, something like that, multiplied by the number of units you produce. So if you produce one, it would be 50 cents. If you produce two, it's a dollar. You produce three, it's a dollar fifty. You're multiplying your cost per unit by how many things you make, and that's gonna give you the variable component of your cost. So when we look at an actual situation, we're gonna have actual numbers here, but the form of our cost function is always going to be A, which represents the fixed component, plus BX, which is going to be the variable cost per unit times the number of units we make. So if we know what our fixed cost is, we know what our variable cost is, and we know how many units we're producing, we can plug in all of those values and that'll tell us what our cost is going to be overall. So the cost is going to go into the actual production. Well, once we produce our product, we then want to sell it. There's a lot of things that go into selling as well, particularly in terms of pricing. How do you determine what you're going to price your product at? And again, we're assuming we're just making one particular item and selling that one particular item. Well, we have to consider demand. We have to consider how much people are willing to pay for our particular product. And how much people want versus price is sort of scaled in the sense that if you price it high, people may not want as much. If you price it low, people are more likely to buy a lot of it. So we're not gonna talk too much about how this kind of function is created. This will be a function that's given to us, but essentially take it as in order to determine the price we're going to set, there are other factors that go into it and we have a function representing our pricing model. So we're gonna call this the price demand function. This represents what our price is going to be. So M and N, those are gonna be fixed values. And then again, X is just going to be the number of items. So in this case, if we're talking about pricing, we're talking about things that we're selling, but X is actually the same in all of these situations. From a practical standpoint, what that means is that as soon as we produce it, we have to sell it. It means we can't have any surplus. We're essentially a make to order business. So if you make it, you sell it, which means the value for X is the same in all these situations. So that's going to be our pricing model based on however many things we produce and sell this will tell us what the actual price is that we're going to set in order to optimize um, our return. Now, revenue is based on how much we price it at and how much we sell. Revenue is the money you put in the cash register. 
So you bring in revenue for each item sold based on your price. So revenue, the money you bring in, is always going to be the price you set times the number of things you sell. So say you sell your item for $2. Well, if you sell one item, your revenue is $2. You sell two items, your revenue is $4. You sell three, your revenue is $6, so on and so forth. So if you take your price, multiply it by how many things you sell, that's going to represent your revenue. Now, revenue is not your bottom line. It's just the money you have in the cash register by the end of the day. So that's going to be our price times X. Now, in this case, if we're using the price demand function, that is going to be the P right here. So we're gonna multiply this particular expression representing our price times the variable X, which again represents how many items we're making and then selling. So profit or loss is what we're really interested in here. So profit is defined as the difference. Difference means subtraction. Difference between revenue and cost. So imagine something really, really simple. Maybe you make something like candy and you make one type of candy, just chocolate bars, okay? So throughout the day, you're selling chocolate bars, money's going into the cash register. At the end of the day, you have to pay for all your costs. So all your supplies, you have to pay your employees, you have to pay for your utilities. You're taking money out of the cash register to pay for all of those different costs for your business. So if you take your revenue, the money in the cash register, and subtract all of that that you have to pay for your bills, then the difference between the two is your profit. And notice it's kind of misleading, there's two P's. Capital P stands for profit, lowercase p stands for price. So all of the big functions, cost, revenue, profit, we think of those as the big ones, they're always going to be represented by a capital letter. Now what profit looks like is going to depend on how revenue and cost are related. So if revenue is greater than cost, in other words, this is a bigger number minus a smaller number, that means when we do that subtraction, it's still gonna be a positive number. That means we have a profit, that means we're in the black. It means we actually have money left over at the end of the day, okay? Now, if revenue is less than cost, that means a smaller number minus a bigger number, the result is gonna be a negative number. If profit is negative, then that means we've taken a loss. It means we had more cost than revenue. It means the money in the cash register didn't fully cover our bills, which of course is a possibility. Now the balancing point is what we call the break even point. So if revenue and cost are exactly the same, in other words, we put our money in the cash register, we pay our bills, and there's nothing left over. We didn't actually lose any money, but we didn't actually make any money either, then we say that the company breaks even. Breaking even is typically what we're really interested in because we know that's the tipping point. Any money made that's more than that is going to give us a profit. Any money made less than that, um, we're going to be losing. So let's look at a couple examples, using these functions, writing these functions, getting some values for them. Make sure you have your graphing calculator handy. We're gonna use that here. Okay, so a manufacturing company finds that its price demand function, its model for pricing, is this particular function. So P of X is equal to 75 minus 3X. And then notice over here, I have an inequality. One is less than or equal to X, and X is less than or equal to 20. All this is telling me is that X has to be between one and 20 inclusive. So it can be one, it can be 20, it can be anything between those. That is actually an inequality representing our domain. It's putting restrictions on our X value on our input. So our domain is going to be all of the X values in that particular range. So that means this function is going to be defined for any X value we choose as long as it's between one and 20 inclusive. Okay, so X in this case is going to be in millions of units. We want to, based on this, write our revenue function and then indicate its domain. Then we wanna compute some of the revenues that we would get based on selling a particular amount based on this profit, this not profit function, this price function and the revenue function. So revenue is defined as our price times the number of items that we make and in this case sell. So our price is gonna be 75 minus 3X 
So that's going to be the value we substitute for P. And then we're multiplying it by X, which is the number of items we're selling. So price times X. Now in this case, this is just a clean it up and simplify it. That actually is the distributive property. It may not look like it because you're probably used to seeing something in front of the parentheses rather than behind it. You could rearrange things. So you could put X in front of the parentheses if you want. But essentially this is distribution, but it's distribution from behind. So if you were to distribute, in other words, multiply X by both of these terms in parentheses, that's going to give you your actual revenue function. So X times 75, it's gonna be 75X, and then X times negative 3X. Well, we know it's gonna be negative. Three is just three. X times X, another name for that is X squared. So negative 3X times X, that distribution, is gonna be negative 3X squared. So 75X minus 3X squared is going to be our revenue function. If we were to substitute in a value for X there, X represents how many items we make and sell in millions, and the output that we get is going to be the monetary value for our revenue. Now, this is how we've written our domain over here. We're not gonna get too much into um, notations for domain, I just want you to see this. These brackets mean take all the numbers between these two endpoints, including the endpoints. So these two notations are just different ways of saying the same thing. The domain is all the numbers from one to 20, including potentially one and 20. So based on this being our revenue function, let's find some actual revenues. So if we sell 1 million units, 4 million, 8 million, 12 million, 16 million, and 20 million. Now I want you to keep in mind, you're not actually going to have to type in millions because X is already defined in terms of millions. So if we were to plug in one, one automatically means 1 million. If we were to plug in a million, that means a million million units, which of course is not what we're interested in. So let's do one by hand, and then I wanna show you how you would use the graphing calculator's table function to help you here. So say we produce one million units, okay? We want the revenue, which means what we're looking for is R of one. We're looking for revenue when our input, when our number of items produced is going to be one or one million. So that tells me to take my revenue function and then substitute in an X value of one. So if we were to do that, it's going to be 75 times one. You can just put parentheses and your calculator knows to multiply. Minus three times one squared. And again, make sure you put parentheses and then your exponent. And so we simplify that down, hit enter and that's gonna be 72, which is going to be millions of dollars. So if we produce and sell 1 million units, we expect to have revenue, not necessarily profit, but revenue, money in the cash register, of $72 million. Now we could do that for the rest of the input values as well, but we can also use the table as a shortcut. So if you go back into your graphing utility, Y equals, clear out whatever's there, we wanna type our revenue function. So 75X minus 3X squared, okay? And then I don't even wanna graph it. I don't care what the graph looks like. I just want some individual values for individual inputs. So I'm gonna go directly into the table. So second and graph takes me into my table. And then I can see some inputs. Now notice in this case, we're gonna have a bunch of different X values. But what we know is that we're really only looking at X values from one to 20. So although the table is going to give us values for pretty much any X value we want, we're specifically limiting ourselves to the values from X equals one all the way out to X equals 20. So our calculator in this case doesn't necessarily know that we have a restriction. If we didn't have any restrictions, then we can plug in anything we want to this function, but we've been told only to look at values between one and 20. So let's verify the answer we got for X equals one. So I'm gonna scroll back. There's X equals one, and we get Y is equal to 72. So we have that matching output. Now we want to find associated outputs for some additional values. So there's four, so when X is four, AKA four million, Y is 252, 
In other words, $252 million. When X is 8, we get 408. When X is 12, we get 468. When X is 16, we get 432. And then when X is 20, we get 300. So those are going to be different revenue values just based on our particular possible production um, values. So one thing that might be interested to explore in this table is what sort of the sweet spot. It might seem counterintuitive that the numbers go down. You would think the more you produce, the more you sell, the more money you're going to make. Well, that's the issue with price and demand though. There is a sweet spot in terms of pricing, in terms of maximizing how many people are willing to buy your stuff. If you price it too low, a lot of people are gonna to wanna to buy it, but you're not making as much money as you could. If you price it too high, well, not as many people will be willing to buy it. So demand takes into account both of those factors, and what you're really looking for is the sweet spot. So revenue is optimized at that sweet spot in the middle where price and demand are balanced. In other words, you're pricing it just right so that as many people as possible wanna buy it, but you're not pricing it so high that your customers start to go away. So how can you find that sweet spot in this case? Well, what we're looking for is where the Y values seem to be maximized. Because notice, you can tell from the table, they're going up and then they start to go down again. So we noticed decline after 12. We went up to 468 and then we started to drop again. So you can see that in the table too. At 11, we're at 462. At 12, we're at 468. 13, we're also at 468. And then 14, we start to drop again. And notice the values are gonna be symmetric at that point. So it looks like the sweet spot is there at 12 and 13. So producing and selling 12 million to 13 million is going to be sort of the optimal situation. We maximize our revenue when that is our particular output. So selling less than that, we're not making as much as we could. Selling more than that, we're losing customers in that sense, just based on our pricing. Okay, so that's a general situation where we might be looking at revenue. Let's look at another component of this. So our company also knows that cost is 125 minus 16X in terms of millions of dollars. So again, X is still millions of units and cost is gonna be in millions of dollars. So notice it's gonna be apples to apples. X means the same thing for each function and then our monetary outputs are gonna be the same kinds of values as well. So we want to write a profit function now. We're interested in the bottom line for producing and selling X million units and then indicate the domain. And then based on our profit function, we wanna find some actual values for our profit for our bottom line. Now this issue with domain, notice we don't have an inequality here. The issue with domain is going to be the same here. So although we weren't given additional restrictions, because we're building off of the same situation, we're building off of the same assumptions of our X values. So the domain is still going to be from 1 to 20 because our profit function is going to use a function we already have that has that domain restriction on it. Again, don't worry too much about domain. It is something to keep in mind, but it's not something we're going to dwell on too much. So profit is defined as revenue minus cost. It's how much is in the cash register minus our bills. Whatever's left over is our profit. So our revenue we determined to be 75x minus 3x squared. So we're gonna substitute that in place of revenue. So revenue minus cost, this is going to be what we substitute for revenue. And notice again, I put parentheses around it. Anytime we substitute something into a formula, get in the habit of putting parentheses around it. So 75x minus 3x squared. And then from our revenue, we're subtracting our cost, which in this case is 125 plus 16x. Now what we're doing is what we call, from an algebraic standpoint, combining like terms. So we wanna simplify this down, and any terms in this expression that match, that are the same kind of term, we wanna to combine together. So how do we know terms combine together? Well, they need to have the same variable, and the variable needs to have the same exponent. 
So for instance, an x and an x squared, those do not combine. They have the same variable, but the exponent is different. So all of the parts have to be the same. The constants can vary, but we need to have the same variable and we need to have the same exponent. So in this case, 75x and then 16x, those are gonna be our like terms. Notice the other two terms here, those would not be like and they don't have anything else to combine with. Now, when we actually simplify all this down, the general standard is to list highest exponent to lowest. Technically, it doesn't make a difference if you don't follow that ordering, but that's just the standard for how we typically write um, functions, how we write equations, particularly when we have exponents. So we're gonna go term by term. We have our x squared. Notice it's subtracted, so that's gonna be a negative term. So negative three x squared is gonna be our first term. Now we have 75x and 16x, but be careful here, because notice everything in that second set of parentheses is subtracted. So that means both of these terms are then subtracted from that first set of parentheses. We're not actually adding 75x and 16x, we're actually subtracting. So 75x minus 16 is gonna give us 59x. And then we're also subtracting 125. So this is going to be the function that models our profit. Notice how many things this takes into account. We developed the revenue function from our pricing and demand function. So it takes both of those into account. And it also takes our cost into account. So in terms of modeling your bottom line, there's a lot of things that go into that. Okay, so this is going to be the function, again, that models our bottom line. We wanna know what's the sweet spot. Ultimately, that's the question we wanna answer. Where do we break even? What's the sweet spot? So let's plug this in to the graphing calculator. Okay, so if you're still in the table and you wanna know how to get out, you can quit to get out. So second and mode will take you out of that. So anytime you're in an actual application and you press clear and nothing seems to be happening, you want to quit and that's gonna take you out of it. Okay, so go into Y equals, clear that revenue function, and then we're gonna type in the profit function. So careful, your three is negative, not subtract, but negative, so negative three X squared plus 59 X minus 125. And that's gonna be our function. So let's go into the table. Second and graph takes us into our table. And we wanna know what's the profit for those same production values, those same values for X. And again, this function, although the table says we can plug in pretty much anything we want, we know that this model is only defined for X values from one to 20. So we're only gonna pay attention to the values from one to 20 in our calculator. So one, representing one million units, would give us an output of negative 69. So that's negative 69 million dollars. In other words, if we produce one million units, we post a loss of negative 69 million dollars. Now if we make four million units, now we're in the black, now it's positive. So 63 million dollars, eight million units is gonna be 155, okay? 9 million, or let's see, we wanted 12, that's the next one. 12 is going to be 151, okay? 13 is going to be 135, let's see, 16 is 51, and then 20, where our model stops, is going to be negative 145, so a loss of negative 145 million dollars. So those are some different values that we get, and keep in mind all the other ones are represented here as well. Now, what does this table not show? It doesn't show any halves. So if X is in terms of millions, we could still make half a million units. So we could still make maybe 1.5 million units. You can't see those values in the table. You'd have to change some settings in order to be able to see fractional X values. But for the most part, these X values are gonna be sufficient for what we wanna do. So looking through this table, where is the sweet spot? It looks like the sweet spot's about at 10. So at 10 million units, we're making a profit of 165 million. Less than that, we're making less profit. More than that, and we're making less profit as well. So it looks like that's going to be the sweet spot. Okay, 
Notice it's different from the sweet spot, quote sweet spot for revenue. Revenue seem to be balanced out at about 12 or 13 million units. So that would maximize our revenue, but in that case, potentially cost would be higher than we'd like. So we wouldn't really get to exactly where we want to be. Now in this case, profit is ultimately what we're interested in. So profit seems to be maximized around 10 million units, maybe between nine and 10, maybe between 10 and 11, it's kind of hard to tell, but somewhere in that general ballpark. Now, where do we break even? Breaking even is also something we're interested in. That tells us where we go from losing money to making money. That's the tipping point. Well, in this case, notice we have values that go in both directions. We're looking at all the values from one to 20. So if we start at one, we're losing money, we're losing money, three, we're making money. So somewhere between two million units and three million units, there has to be a zero. If we go from nine, negative 19 to positive 25, well, there's a value of zero somewhere in the middle. So if we were to make between two million and three million units, at some point between those values, we're breaking even. Now also, because we peak and then drop in terms of our outputs, we may have another possible break-even point. So if you look at producing 17 million and then producing 18 million, we also go from positive profit and then negative, which is loss. So also somewhere between 17 million and 18 million, we have another break-even point. So those are gonna, again, what are gonna be the tipping points. Those are gonna be the points where we go from making money to losing money or vice versa. So there's a lot that goes into analyzing profit loss, what's sort of the optimal situation for a business. This is again, a very, very basic situation, just modeling these functions in the most basic sense. But keep in mind, these kind of analyses are done at a different level um, all the time by businesses in lots of different situations. So just to sum up, um, we've talked about a function, we know what functions are, we have some strategies for graphing at this point. Again, functions are sort of the context for a lot of different algebraic situations. So we're going to encounter functions of different types throughout our discussions um, this in this particular course. Um, these are just a few functions that you can look at. We know how to use function notation now, start to get used to that notation, we're gonna continue using it, and we're of course gonna build from there.